In the last episode, we explored the deepest depths of the Nascuan Sea, as well as the causes of the proto nascuan extinction. Today, we will take a look at the early terra diversity, as well as the first motile colonizers of dry land. First, however, we will take a deeper look into the climate of Nusku. In Episode 3, we generalized the climate of Nusku into very broadly defined zones that have different characteristics. While this is an alright view of the climate, it would be like generalizing Earth's climate like this. Which again is okay, but the real world is a lot more complex than these broad stroke generalizations. Therefore, we will be taking a more in-depth look at Nusku's climate before we move on to explore dry land. In order to properly flush out Nusku's climate, we need to first understand the planet's wind patterns and ocean currents. On tidally locked worlds, winds typically travel towards the subsolar point. That is, the point that sits directly below the star and takes the most direct sunlight, unless the planet in question rotates very quickly. Tidally locked planets by definition have to rotate, in order to keep the same side of the planet facing the star at all times. They have to take the same amount of time to orbit the star as they do to complete a full rotation. Since Nusku orbits extremely close to its star, its orbital period is a little over six Earth days. That means that the planet rotates in about the same amount of time. In terms of tidally locked planets, a rotational period of six days is pretty quick. This means that Nusku will have a strong Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect is the effect of a planet's rotation on its ocean and atmosphere. Nusku's stronger Coriolis effect will make the winds coming from the north and south weaker, and make the winds coming from the east and west stronger. However, winds originating in the west will be stronger than those in the east. The result of this will be a wind pattern where the easterly and westerly winds meet in a crescent at the subsolar point. When you take the major mountain ranges and highland areas into account, here is what the wind patterns will look like. The ocean currents on tidally locked worlds generally look something like this. When you factor in Nusku's major land masses, the global currents will look something like this. The climate of Nusku can be largely inferred simply based on these two things. Precipitation and cloud cover will be most common around the areas where the easterly and westerly winds meet, so most of the tropical areas will be concentrated around here. Drier areas can be inferred when wind passes over major mountain ranges, creating a rain shadow. Temperate areas are basically everywhere else that isn't too far from the subsolar point. Tundras are at the far reaches of the daylight side, and a permanent ice cap forms the majority of the night side of the planet, along with a few areas creeping onto the day side. Remember, the time period during and directly after the proto nascuan extinction is a much cooler time period. So the tundra and ice caps are a lot larger than usual, and the sea levels are slightly lower. Keep in mind that this climate model is still far from perfect, but it's still quite an upgrade from the very vague one that we had earlier. With this new knowledge of Nesku's climate, let's talk about the Terraphyllo's early diversity on land. The first Terraphyllo groups that invaded land likely made their home in the tropical regions near the subsolar point. Here, there is a lot of rainfall and cloud cover, so our alien flora won't risk drying out. The competition will be essentially non-existent, and with nothing to eat them yet, the Terraphylo will have a very easy time conquering the land. Pressure will be put on the organisms to grow taller to outcompete their neighbors. So perhaps a new clade emerges that simply grows as tall as physically possible growing leaves along the entire stem of the organism. They will retain their ancestral ability to create new leaves at the top of the plant, and discard old leaves when they reach the bottom. Unfortunately, they will appear some time before any clade evolves wood, which is a necessary adaptation in growing past a certain height. So these creatures will still be constrained by that. However, some of the largest members of this clade will reach the height of some sunflowers on Earth. We will call them Erectophyte, and they will appear 1.902 billion years into the timeline. While Erectophyte grew taller to gain access to more sunlight, another clade may take an entirely different approach. 
growing giant leaves to claim as much sunlight as possible. Nothing exists on land to eat the leaves at this time, so they can grow to cover as much space as possible, preventing any competitors from growing around them. Eventually, this group's leaves may grow so large that they may require the ground to support their massive size. So the body of this plant may grow shorter so that the leaves can be supported by the ground beneath. This clade may find great success in flat areas, where their leaves can easily find space to grow, and where taller terophyllo struggle due to strong wind. Their leaves and the leaves of their neighbors will prevent any taller plants that manage to grow from growing too close. However, their low profile to the ground means that their seed dispersal will be low. So perhaps when the female gametangia start producing seeds, the seed stalks begin to grow vertically, so as to have the highest seed dispersal possible. We will call this clade Brevophyte, and they will appear 1.905 billion years into the timeline. Moving north, our alien flora will encounter drier environments than the climate that they initially evolved in. In addition, cloud cover and rainfall will be much less common up here. Perhaps some clades make the transition from the clouded, wet, coastal regions near the subsolar point to the hotter and more desert-like climate of the northern parts of the continent. These flora will need to adapt to the drier conditions and increase sun exposure if they are to survive. Maybe one clade of Erectophyte evolves to keep its leaves pressed up against its stem. This will decrease the amount of surface area losing moisture into the air, and in turn allow this clade of flora to get by on much less water. They can also use this adaptation to help store water. Opening the space between their leaves and stem during the infrequent rainstorms and collecting as much water as possible. This adaptation will call for the shape of their leaves to be modified, with a specially adapted reserve for storing water. Unfortunately, decreasing the surface area to help conserve water also means that there will be less surface area for photosynthesis. This is no problem though, as the area that this group of flora calls home experiences close to constant and uninterrupted sunlight. We will name this clade Hamifolius, and they will appear on the arid lands of Nusku 1.906 billion years into the timeline. Perhaps a clade of the basal terophyllo also evolves to live in the arid interior of the continent. Perhaps this clade evolves to deal with the dry heat by retracting their leaves within their body. Maybe the central point where the basal terophyllo grow their leaves out of becomes a basin where the leaves can be retracted into. In addition, perhaps this clade becomes the first to display a similar branching pattern to plants on Earth. This way, several of these leaf basins, which we will call leaf bulbs, can grow. Each bulb will grow several leaves that can slowly be extended and retracted as per the needs of the organism. When they need to photosynthesize, they may extend their leaves, and when they don't need to, they may retract their leaves to save water. This cycle can be synchronized with the opening and closing of the stomata on the leaves to create a very efficient system of reducing transpiration, or the evaporation of water through the leaves. While this is a great system for saving water, it is not the greatest for this organism's reproductive strategy, since all terophyllo use their leaves as female gametangia, and this clave relies on packing their leaves tightly together within the leaf bulb. There may not be enough room for one leaf to become a female gametangia, so perhaps they evolve to have the entire leaf bulb be the female gametangia. When one or a few leaves within the bulb collect enough gametes on the surface of their leaves, they may retract all of their leaves for good, and the bulb will change all of its contents from leaves into seeds, thus turning the bulb into a seed bulb. Once the seeds are mature, different species may opt for different methods of dispersing them. Some species may let all of the seeds fall out of the seed bulb before regrowing their leaves and returning the bulb to its function as a leaf bulb. Other species may detach the seed bulb entirely, letting all of the seeds go at the same time and regrowing the whole bulb. We will call this clade Bulbophyte, and they will appear 
1.911 billion years into the timeline. It is important to note that although both of these clades have especially adapted to living in hot areas with long periods of limited water access, there will still be some areas where it is just too hot and dry. For the time being, these areas will remain completely devoid of any alien flora. Moving even further north, we reach a stretch of land where the climate is significantly more moderate. Here, members of the previous clades may find success. However, new clades of flora may arise to populate the northern region as well. Remember, the further we move from the subsolar point, the closer the star in the sky is to the horizon. In these areas, it is less beneficial to have a large surface area pointing up, and more beneficial to have a large surface area pointing sideways. Perhaps a clade of basal terraphylla, native to this northern area, evolved to have all of their leaves point sideways. We will name them Latisphite, and they will appear 1.908 billion years into the timeline. This clade will find great success in cool climates. However, for the time being, the coldest areas near the Terminator will remain largely uninhabited by any species of flora. Now, let's move away from sessile photosynthesizers and discuss how the fauna of Nusku have been progressing towards the invasion of land. Land is a difficult challenge for water-based organisms to adapt to. We know that because we discussed how the terraphylo adapted to life on land previously. However, some of these challenges are made slightly different when an organism's survival depends on their ability to move. The first and perhaps the most obvious challenge terrestrial creatures need to face is how to breathe. All the clades of ocean fauna at this time are especially adapted to breathing in water. If a creature does not have a way of respirating during its time on land, it will asphyxiate. The second challenge is one that may be most noticeable when a creature first comes onto land. Organisms adapted for life in the water don't really have to support their weight much at all. So when a water-based organism comes onto land, it has no way to support itself and so will collapse under the pressure of its own weight. The third challenge is one that won't immediately take effect, but will cause problems for any creature that decides to stay on land long term. All of our creatures need to retain water in their body in order to survive. If a creature goes on land and dries out, it will die of dehydration. In order for land-dwelling adaptations to evolve, creatures must be exposed to these three challenges without being killed by their effects. That way, creatures can still pass on their genes, but there is still a selective pressure that allows them to evolve towards a full-time land-dwelling existence. One place where these external pressures are common, but still accessible, is in the intertidal zone. I've mentioned the intertidal zone before, back in episode 3, when the first terrestrial propungus evolved. The intertidal zone is the area of shore that is covered in water at high tide, but exposed at low tide. Creatures that specialize to live here will either have to leave at low tide or stick around and brave dry land for a time. Since this planet is tidally locked, Nusku does not experience a solar tide, so the planet only has a lunar tide. During this time period, Nusku's moon Enki makes one rotation around Nusku every 32 hours. That means that a given beach on Nusku will experience a high tide about every 16 hours. This means that any creatures who choose to stay and brave the low tide will either need to survive for several hours, return to the ocean, or spend some time in tide pools. Let us take a look at some of these pioneering organisms. One clade that very likely will find itself living in this area is the Thylazotesta. These shelled creatures attach themselves to the seafloor at the end of their larval stage. There, they make a shell and begin the adult stage of their life. These creatures really don't choose where they land as they don't have eyes, so it's really a game of luck. It is completely possible that many individuals end up in the intertidal zone, and if they cannot survive short periods of air exposure, they will surely die. So maybe one clade of Thylazotesta specializes in making use of this part of the seabed. 
Perhaps a lineage evolved some simple tissue to pull a part of the shell over their mouth openings after the creature retracts its arms. This watertight seal will minimize moisture loss while the creature is exposed to the air. It will also take a shorter, broader shape since when the tide changes, members of this clade will be exposed to a bombardment of waves, and a shorter shape will prevent the waves from easily ripping this creature from its position. These organisms will also need to find a way to breathe while above water. Perhaps, while the tide is up, they take in as much water they can into special reserves inside of their body. This water will not only keep them internally wet, but it will also help them store oxygen for some time. They can in turn use the oxygen in the water for respiration during low tide. We will name this clade Parvatesta, and they will appear 1.894 billion years into the timeline. The Pelis lamina are notorious for preying on the Thalazatesta, so it makes sense that when a clade of Thalazatesta specializes for life in the intertidal zone, the Pelis lamina would soon follow. Unfortunately, the Pelis lamina have no shell that they can hide in to retain moisture. In addition, their legs are extremely weak, as the water helps support much of their body. So a Pelis lamina that tried to brave dry land would completely collapse due to its soft body. It would then dry out and die. In order to overcome this challenge, a new clade of Pelis lamina may evolve to drag its soft, blobby body across the intertidal zone, with wide and strong, tentacle-like legs. The amount of time they can spend on land will be limited, not only because they will dry out if they don't return to the water, but also because they need water to breathe. Perhaps they get around this by evolving to store water in their breathing pores on their back to extend their stay on land. This will allow members of the clade plenty of time to forage for Parvatesta during low tide. However, their water storage will not last forever, so they will need to spend some of their time either in tide pools or making the trek back to the ocean to re-moisturize. These creatures will likely only be able to spend about an hour of time on dry land before they have to return to some form of water. We will call this clade Patchypod, and they will appear 1.896 billion years into the timeline. It is very possible that a member of this group of organisms becomes the very first to be entirely land-based. During the proto nascuan extinction, many areas saw a decrease in the amount of oxygen dissolved in water. The food source of the patchypods, the parvatesta, rely entirely on storing oxygenated seawater inside of their body in order to survive during low tide. If the water that they stored was significantly less oxygenated, the parvatesta would asphyxiate and die. This may result in a much lower population of parvatesta during this period. Although the amount of time the patchypods can spend on land is reduced, they can overcome the reduced oxygen levels by simply returning to the sea more often. However, the declining population of their main food source means that they may need to find something else to subsist on. On the beaches near the subsolar point, just beyond the intertidal zone, there are plentiful groves of terraphylo, an untapped food source just waiting for these patchypods to make use of. Perhaps a group of patchypods starts to use the terraphylo near the beaches as a food source. Their arms are already well adapted to grabbing things like terraphylo parts. However, digesting plant matter means that these patchypods will require a more robust gut. So perhaps the patchypods start out by eating the more easily digestible terraphylo seeds. Eventually, as this group begins to become more and more dependent on plant matter, their digestive tract will increase in length and complexity, allowing these organisms to digest other parts of the plant. Their new diet will mean that the patchypods will be spending a lot more time on land than ever before. Going back and forth to the sea every hour will limit their access to terraphylo. Being able to breathe air will certainly help extend this time frame. Maybe the ancient larvae of all clades descended from Pelis lamina have special organs adapted for gas exchange. This adaptation allowed for the larva to combat their weight with buoyancy, very similar to the swim bladders of Earth's fish. 
These organs are minimized near the back of the pelvis lamina's outside throats during adulthood, as adult pelvis lamina don't need to float and so do not require these organs. However, a group of pachypods may retain this organ into adulthood, demonstrating neoteny. This new group may use the alien's swim bladder like a lung to breathe air. As a result, the outside mouths may be repurposed, being solely used for breathing. Therefore, the openings may move away from the feeding mouths so as to not be obstructed while this organism is feeding. For a time, they may use both their gills and their lungs for breathing, being able to breathe both air and water. However, their lifestyle change may make it less beneficial for them to breathe water and so their gills may lose their function, instead being used for a different purpose, perhaps for reproduction. Remember, all descendants of the potty lamina have their offspring develop outside of their body. This is not ideal for land dwellers, as the offspring could easily die out. Luckily, there is a new cavity that now has no purpose, and has an entrance right next to the reproductive surfaces. So maybe the old gills become a sort of womb where offspring can develop without the danger of drying out. However, these gills are also this clade's sense of smell. So maybe one gill becomes used for reproduction and moves towards the rear of the body, and the other becomes specialized solely for scent and moves to the front of the body. This is an example of an asymmetric trait, a visible trait that seems to violate the organism's symmetry. This is a real phenomena seen in many creatures on Earth. So, this new clade's reproductive strategy will require both partners to rub their reproductive surfaces together and excrete gametes with the goal of getting a number of both individuals' gametes into both individuals' reproductive gills. From there, the gametes unite, resulting in the offspring attaching themselves to the inside of their parent. There, they stay until they are ready to be released into the world and survive on their own. These organisms will evolve increasingly thicker skin to help prevent water from evaporating out of their body. This array of adaptations will allow this new clade, which we will name Crassipod, to leave the water behind and become the first ever solely land-dwelling clade 1.922 billion years into the timeline. They still lack any internal or external skeleton, and so are still stuck dragging themselves across the ground making them very vulnerable to predators. However, at the time that they first conquer land, they will be the only inhabitants, and so they can grow to pretty large sizes without fear of being hunted. As these creatures begin to populate the continent, moving away from their origin just south of the subsolar point, they may meet some competition from a new clade that emerged shortly after the Crassipod. About 1.923 billion years into the timeline, a new clade of Acritesta will appear, evolving in a wet river valley just north of the southern coast. The Acritesta are the primary bottom feeders in many of the freshwater habitats of Nusku. While they mainly eat algae-like organisms, they basically eat whatever lies unused at the bottom of the lake or river that they inhabit. Due to the wave of algal blooms leading up to the proto nuscuan extinction, the subsequent decomposition of the colossal amount of algae used up a lot of oxygen. This process caused a huge drop in oxygen seen across the planet. However, some areas were hit harder than others. Maybe some lakes found just north of the subsolar point have some extremely low oxygen levels. This paired with the fact that this series of lakes may support large algal blooms of their own far beyond the proto nuscuan extinction may create the perfect condition for an aquatic creature like the Acritesta to begin breathing air. Air always has a higher concentration of oxygen than water, and when water is anoxic, breathing air is even more advantageous. Perhaps initially, this group of Acritesta started using their breathing pores for both breathing water and air. However, later on, this new clade will exclusively breathe air. In addition to their new air-breathing lungs, this Acritesta clade will evolve a way to support its own weight on land. Their shell is extremely heavy for their boneless legs to carry. So even in shallow water, the basal Acritesta may struggle to stand. Perhaps in some groups, the shell of the Acritesta expanded to cover parts of this creature's legs. Maybe the shell on the legs becomes segmented 
and eventually gains a purpose quite different than defense. Perhaps over a few million years, this Acritesta lineage displays a partial exoskeleton. The segments of shell that cover their legs may help bear the weight of the rest of the organism. Perhaps this is where they get their name, Testapod. These new legs will certainly help the creature. However, it will also make eating more difficult, as crouching down with this new exoskeleton is clumsy. In order to get around this, the front part of this clade may become longer and almost trunk-like, so that this creature can access the ground with their mouths more easily. It is also possible that their mouth parts gain some type of teeth made from the same material that makes up their shell. This will help them process the plant matter as they eat it. There is still one more problem that these testopods need to solve in order to conquer land. The parts of their body not covered by their partial exoskeleton will be exposed to the dry air. This can mostly be solved by increasing the thickness and durability of their skin. However, their reproductive parts may require more adaptations. The major reproductive part in all Aspitesta groups is the tail-like protrusion found at the back of the organism. They reproduce by rubbing their reproductive tails with a partner to trade gametes. The gametes from both individuals then unite and form new offspring. These offspring are then bonded to their parents' tails, where they are protected until they mature enough to survive on their own. Therefore, this new land-dwelling clade will need a way to prevent their offspring from being exposed to the elements. This adaptation is quite simple. This clade may simply press their tail to the underside of their body while their young are still developing, forming an airtight seal with their young sandwiched in between their reproductive tail and the underside of their body. Testopods may become very successful herbivores. Being well adapted to eating low-lying vegetation means that they won't have to compete with the crassipods, who can use their feeding arms in general larger size to reach leaves too high for the testopods. The rising abundance of herbivores on land may prompt the evolution of a new predator. The Repolumida are a clade of fish-like Loricatrum stoma that live in fresh water. They primarily prey on cerastomes and other freshwater fish of that size. However, during the testopods transition to land, several amphibious species may have found themselves large enough to be on the menu. These transitional species had to return to the water very often in order to rehydrate their skin-covered underside. This is when the Repolomita would catch its prey. Its strong front fins could help this creature pull itself into shallow water to pursue a testopod that's rehydrating. When the majority of the testopod groups became completely land-based, they will leave the threat of predation mostly behind too. However, although more rarely than their amphibious predecessors, land-based testopods will still have to return to the water to drink. But since they no longer have to submerge half their body in the water, the Repolimita will have to pull themselves further on the land than ever before in order to secure a kill. Perhaps over several million years, this predator-prey relationship, along with some environmental factors, helps push a clade of Repolimita onto land. First though, this new Repolimita group will need to breathe air if they are to become land-dwelling. You may remember that all members of the Loricatrum stomaclade have cavities capable of gas exchange within their exoskeleton. This evolved so that air could counteract the weight of the exoskeleton with buoyancy. This is very similar to the larva of the Pelis lamina discussed earlier. Perhaps in the anoxic waters of the post nascuan extinction, a group of Repolimita evolved to use these cavities to their advantage. Small holes may evolve that connect the cavities within the exoskeleton to the outside air. This breathing system resembles that of arthropods, so we will call these holes by the same name, sphericals. Different species may have different numbers of these sphericals in different places. It is important to note that this breathing method is passive, meaning that oxygen diffuses passively through the respiratory system into the blood. This may put them at a disadvantage in the future, but for now, this respiratory system will set them up for success on land. There is one problem. The young of the Loricatrum stoma don't have a properly developed exoskeleton, and so don't have a properly developed set of these cavities that the respiratory system evolved from. So perhaps the young of this clade live in the water, making use of their old gills to breathe. This lifestyle difference between young and adult members of this clade may prompt the evolution of metamorphosis. 
Metamorphosis is the process of an organism undergoing a significant change in their structure as they mature into an adult. In simpler terms, the young of this clade will look quite different from their adult counterparts. Metamorphosis is a pretty common phenomena seen on Earth, and in fact, it has already appeared on Nusku. On Nusku, it is seen in the transition that many Pisces Lamina descendants go through as they move from their free-floating planktonic mode of living to their seabed inhabiting one. Metamorphosis will certainly grant some advantages on land. For one, young and inexperienced individuals won't have to compete with more physically mature and experienced adults for resources. However, the fact that their larval form breathes water means that members of this clade will be bound to the rivers and lakes for reproduction. Another challenge that the Repolometa will have to overcome on land is a way to support itself. Although they already use their front two fins to pull themselves through shallow water, as they spend more and more time on land, it may become much easier to include their rear fins in the movement. So all of their fins may become larger, more segmented, and over many million years, very leg-like. These new legs will give them a huge advantage over the slow-moving prey items that they will find on land. We will name this clade Arthropolma, and they will begin terrorizing the land about 1.928 billion years into the timeline. We will discuss how these three initial clades spread out and diversify across the main Nuskuan continent in a future episode. Naming and documenting every species on this alien world would be impossible, and would completely halt the progress of this project. So the clades outlaid today should be taken as a general representation of the Nuskuan flora and fauna. In the next episode, we will return to the ocean to explore how the ocean inhabitants recover from the proto nuskuan extinction. Thank you for watching. I would just like to take this time to credit and thank everyone who has made art for this video. You really help make these videos look better and improve the time frame in which I can output them. If you would like to make art for a video, talk with the community, or just know the progress of the next video, you should join our Discord. Link in the description. Thank you again for watching.